All right, and up next is going to be the co-main event of the evening in the UFC's featherweight division. You have a battle between former top contender, now number 13 ranked fighter in the division, and Dan 50K Ige going up against Damon the Leech Jackson. Ige comes into this fight with a record of 15 victories and 6 defeats on the side of Damon Jackson. He has an impressive record of 22 victories, 4 defeats, and I believe one no contest with Dan Ige. We'll look at him really quick. 15 and six overall out of those 15 victories. It would load because this computer is slow. He has nine wins by way of finish and six by decision. So pretty overall well-rounded fighter Four knockouts, five submissions out of his six losses. He's never been submitted, never been knocked out. He wins or he's lost all six of his losses via decision or should I say all six of his losses come by way of decision when you look at Damon Jackson he's on a little bit of a run here man I mean let's just be honest here I didn't pick him to beat Pat Sabatini I didn't pick him to beat Dan Argueta I thought Argueta was going to give him a lot more trouble with the wrestling a lot more trouble with the takedowns and I thought it was going to be a lot harder for Damon Jackson to employ his wrestling game to control Argueta on the top. And Argueta fights on this card as well against Isaac Dolgarian. We're just not breaking that fight down on this podcast, but he is competing on the same card. And when you look at Damon Jackson, 22-4-1, out of his 22 victories, he has 15 by way of submission, 4 by knockout or TKO, and 3 by decision. So 19 out of 22 wins for Damon Jackson come by way of finish. He just got a knockout in his last fight. And then, well, his nickname says Damon Action Jackson, but I could have sworn in his last fight it was Damon the Leech Jackson. So maybe he changed his nickname. But in his last fight, he got a TKO in the first round, a minute and nine seconds in uh, over Pat Sabatini. I mean, he pretty much caught Sabatini closing the distance with a front kick or a knee up the middle, heard him, jumped on him, took him down in a body lock position, got in the mount, punched him, you know, basically into submission, but... Pat Sabatini gave up his back. He jumped on him, boom, 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 and finished him off, and the ref jumped in. And that was a fight where a lot of people were on the side of Sabatini, myself included. I was very confident in Pat Sabatini in that fight, and Damon Jackson came in and shut it down against Dan Argueta. I had Argueta to beat Damon Jackson with his wrestling, with his takedowns, you know, with his pressure on the feet. And although he looked good for the first half, a little bit over the first half of the third round, he was getting dominated. He was getting taken down, controlled from the mount, controlled from the half guard, controlled from the body triangle. Damon Jackson did a lot of control from the back body triangle or the body triangle position on the back of Dan Argueta. And coming from a guy in Argueta who is a very, very solid wrestler, a standout wrestler, uses his grappling, uses his wrestling his submissions to win all of his fights. You know, Damon Jackson dominated him in the grappling, and that's something you have to look at in this fight. He then had an arm triangle choke submission in the second round over Kamuela Kirk. He's got a unanimous decision win over Charles Rosa, who is also known as a standout grappler. So he knocks out a standout grappler and submission artist in Sabatini. He out-wrestles and out-grapples, uses his jiu-jitsu in better positioning or superior positioning against Argueta, who's known for his superior wrestling and jiu-jitsu. And then he submits Charles Rosa, who, although he didn't have the most success in the UFC, he's a very, very solid jiu-jitsu artist and grappler in his own right. He lost to Ilya Teporia via knockout. That's actually the last loss that he had. But coming off of how good Teporia looked against Bryce Mitchell, I don't think that's really a bad thing to look at for Damon Jackson because after that loss to Teporia, he's on a four-fight win streak, including two finishes and two decisions, one by way of submission with the arm triangle over Kirk, and then most recently the TKO after that front kick and barrage of punches on the ground against Pat Sabatini, who, like I said, in that fight, even though the line was close, a lot of people were on the side of Sabatini, myself included. Out of his four losses, he has three losses by way of KO, TKO, and one by submission. Never lost the decision. Every time the fights go to decision for Jackson, he has won those fights, but 19 out of his 22 wins do come by way of finish. When you look at Dan Ige, like I said, man, he's just been on a rough patch. 15-6, and six, we've already talked about it, but he's lost th uh, four out of his last five fights and uh, four out of his last six fights. Or uh, five out of his last six? Wait, hold on. One, two, three, four. Four out of his last five and uh, four out of his last six. So his last 
loss came to Movsar Evloya via unanimous decision at UFC Fight Night 207. He then lost the unanimous decision to Josh Emmett. That should have been a split decision. It was very close. I could have even seen seen the judges giving it to uh, Dan Ige in that fight because even though he lost the first round pretty decisively, he came back towards the end of the first, clearly won the second with superior striking and defensive ability. And then in the third, it was very close back and forth, basically neck and neck on significant strikes. In the Chan Sung Jung fight, I mean, he just got out-wrestled, out-grappled, out-controlled, um, got dropped by Chan Sung Jung. Didn't really have much of anything in terms of offense. The fight was pretty clear in the side of the Korean Zombie. And then going into the Gavin Tucker fight, I picked Gavin Tucker. I was pretty confident in Tucker's ability to outstrike Ige on the feet. He comes in, catches him with a right hand right down the middle and knocks him out um, in 22 seconds of the first round. After that, or before that, a close competitive fight, even though it was clear that Kelvin Cater won the decision. Um, you know, it was a close and competitive fight with Cater. Prior to that, he won a unanimous a split decision, I'm sorry, over Edson Barbosa. But a lot of people thought that Barbosa did enough to win that fight um, against Ige. And that was Barbosa's first fight down at 145 pounds back in May of 2020 at UFC on ESPN 8. He had a split decision victory over Mirsan Bektic, a unanimous decision over Kevin Aguilar, rear naked choke submission over Danny Henry. Uh, this unanimous decision over Jordan Griffin, TK over Mike's Mike Santiago, a loss to Julio Arce via decision, you know, a win over Luis Gomez on the contender series via submission. But, you know, like I said, he's one in four in his last five fights. And the only win is to Gavin Tucker, but the losses, Kelvin Cater, Chan Sung Jung, Josh Emmett, and Mo Sarvloyev. Like he's not losing to cans here, even though Ige hasn't looked great in most of his recent fights, even some of the ones he won, like the win against Edson Barbosa, he's losing to the upper echelon of the featherweight division. And I venture to say that if Damon Jackson fought a Kelvin Cater, a Mo Sarvloyev, a Josh Emmett, etc., etc., that Damon Jackson would lose those fights as well and probably get finished just going off of how the fight with Ilya Teporia went. But Teporia might come in and become champion by the end of 2023. I mean, with the way he's been dominating these fights, aside from the scare against uh, Jai Herbert at 155, the guy's a monster. He could be the 145-pound champ by the end of the year if, you know, the, everything folds out in his favor or unfolds in his favor. But going on the prediction, look, I think Damon Jackson is going to have the wrestling advantage. He's going to have the grappling advantage. We've seen Ige have problems with wrestlers and grapplers like Ivloyev. Same with, you know, Chan Sung Jung was able to out-wrestle him, out-grapple him, out-control him. Josh Emmett um, wasn't really, didn't really have too much success with the takedowns. Got a couple, but then Ige got right back up. Or uh, That was actually him off of a knockdown. He got hit with the right hand, was able to work his way back up and actually take down um, Emmett. I think that Ige has good offensive wrestling, but in this fight, he more than likely is just going to want to stick to fighting on the feet. Damon Jackson is a good striker. He has a good right hand, a good hook, um, decent straight punches. I think the straight punches when Ige closes the pocket are going to be the best weapons for Jackson to try to catch Ige exploding and um, exploit his defense. But we saw how good his defense looked at 269 against Josh Emmett. And the defense got better as the fight played out. And I honestly think that this is a fight that it's Ige's fight to lose. I know that Jackson's on a big win streak. I know that Ige's 1-4 in, in his last five. But I think this is a really, really well-made fight. And I think it's a tailor-made fight for Dan Ige to win. Even though the grappling and the jiu-jitsu of Damon Jackson does worry me, I think that Dan Ige's ability to use that jab and keep Damon Jackson at a distance, to use those stance switch combinations, the right hand, the right hook into the overhand left or the right hook into the left hook, the, the cross left right hook into the left hook, the left hook into the right hook, the left hook into the right hook, back into the left hook off the stance switch. He's very good at mixing it up. And if Ige can fight behind his jab and work the body and work his combinations, he has the power to put away Damon Jackson. And I actually think he does it here. I think this is a fight where Dan Ige is going to be the better technical striker. He's going to have more volume. He's going to mix it up better. Damon Jackson's going to be the better jiu-jitsu artist, the better grappler, the better positional grappler. He's going to have more positional and better positional awareness than Ige does on the mat. I don't think it's going to be easy for Jackson to take him down, but I do think in the second and in the third, if Ige hasn't hurt him enough with his power, that he will be able to out-grapple him, outwork him, and potentially work his way to a decision. I don't see Jackson getting a finish in this fight. I don't see Damon Action Jackson finding a finish on Ige because Ige is notoriously difficult to finish, even though he's been on this downward spiral I still think Ige can pull it out here I mean just looking at the guys he's lost to he's losing to the upper upper echelon of the 145 pound division 
some of the top guys, some of the top prospects in the sport. And he's got the power to shut out the lights on Jackson. And I think he does it. I think that he's going to close the distance, use the jab to set up Damon Jackson, find his way into the pocket, land a right hook into the left hook. He's going to land the right hand on the chin of Damon Jackson, sit him down and jump on him for the TKO. So even though it might not be the most popular pick this week because I think a lot of people are riding with Jackson based off of his win streak based off of his record based off the inconsistencies of 50k Dan Ige recently I'm gonna go with Ige to shut the lights out on Damon Jackson so my pick is going to be Dan 50k Ige to defeat Damon Action Jackson via a second round TKO you know what I'm gonna go out on a limb I'm gonna go first round I'm gonna go first round TKO he finds the chin drops him jumps on him and puts him out um, so my pick is Dan 50K Ige to defeat Damon Action Jackson, the number 13 ranked Dan Ige to defeat Damon Action Jackson via first round TKO and get back on the winning track, which he desperately, desperately needs, especially if he wants to continue his career in the UFC.